when somebody engages with a nonprofit, you know, to look at the value of the relationship. And from the nonprofit perspective, what I'd say is to think in terms of if somebody joins the board of my organization or somebody is a donor of my organization, let's think in terms of a partnership. Let's think in terms of like, how can I, as the nonprofit, help that partner, which may sound like I'm trying to turn something on its ear. Are you looking to improve your sales skills without compromising your values? Welcome to Sales Made Easy, a podcast for business and personal growth. Join Harry Spate, author of Selling with Dignity, your formula for life-changing sales results, as he hosts sales experts and business owners who share their journeys of personal growth and business success without resorting to pushy sales tactics. Now, here's your host, Harry. Tommy DeMisa making an appearance live from atop the Empire State Building in New York, New York. Tommy is the nonprofit sector connector. He's a philanthropist. He is a podcast host, and he has got tons of energy. Today, we're going to talk sales, how to make it easy, and a whole bunch of other things about networking and connecting. Tommy D., welcome to the Sales Made Easy podcast. What is the good word, sir? What's up, my brother? Good to see you. I'm glad to be here. I wish I was at the top of the Empire State Building, but... Fortunately, I am two flights up from my kitchen, just below the roof, top of my house, in my attic. And that's where I hail from many days, although they do let me out more often than they did just a couple short years ago. I'm fired up to be here, Harry. I remember you talking to me about this and you said, you know, I want to have you come on my show, my podcast, this whole thing. And like, that was like a month and a half ago. And now we're here and like, time flies, but it drags at the same time sometimes. Because I was like, I know I'm supposed to be a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, oh man, I'm supposed to be on Harry's show. I got to call Harry and find out when that's supposed to happen. And then I, I realized it is, uh, it's happening today. Today is the day. Today is especially, you have an on-air sign. I have an on-air sign. I mean, very cool to be here with you. So listen, I, I know we're going to talk and that's what I like to do, but I want to let you take over again because this is your show. I have my own shows to do. Oh man, it's the wind-up doll. All I have to do is say a couple of words. And off you go like the ever ready battery. Funny. Okay. So uh, yeah. this is great. I don't know how I got the Empire State Building uh, all messed up with the time when you're it's, at it. It's all good, man. It's very close. The house is very tall. So I can understand why you would confuse it with the yes. Empire State Building. I'm about 35 miles east of the Empire State Building where I hail right now. All right. So uh, beautiful Long Island, I understand. Strong Island. That's right. So we are going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the magnificent things that you're doing to make the world a better place. Um, I know we want to talk a little bit about uh, blowing up connections and helping um, businesses grow that way and helping your clients. But one of the things that uh, really stands out for me is, uh, aside from your incredible energy, is the fact that you're so busy in the nonprofit space. And I just want to start there. So tell me, how did you get started and what is it you actually do there? All right. Well, that's a really good place to start and I appreciate it. And I've tried to like trace back how I got to become the nonprofit sector connector. You know, it is a moniker I gave myself, but it's funny when people start to introduce you that way. And I've become this thing called the nonprofit sector connector. It's funny. One of my business partners said, man, you're determined. He goes, you said you were going to be the nonprofit sector connector and now you are. So who is this business partner I'm referring to? So we are in the employee benefits business. We own an agency called Vanguard Benefits, just rebranded as Vanguard Benefits. And we do employee benefits. About seven years ago, we sat down, my two partners, Ed and Vinny, and we said, we want to have a focus, a niche focus into a specific industry, specific vertical for the services we provide, employee benefits. And at the time, it was actually Vinny Blasi who came up and said, look, nonprofits are great. And at the same time, I had just... Well, I was still at uh, Trinet, but I was leaving Trinet, which is a professional employer organization. At the time, we were looking at it, and we, I had seen what Trinet called verticalization. It was their focus on industries, and they would have specific products, specific service professionals into these industries. So Vinny said, we like nonprofit. Let's do nonprofit. I've been playing around with nonprofit a little bit. And then we said, okay, we're going to do it. I don't think any of us really knew what that actually meant, but for me, what it meant was, I joined a handful of nonprofit boards. I started getting very involved in the nonprofit sector. I started to look around for professionals. I'll give you one name, my buddy Ken Serini, who runs Serini and Associates County out here in Long Island. Uh, 
I look to guys like that and I, I watched what they were doing and their connections and their relationships in the nonprofit sector. And I said, well, I'm going to make these guys my friends and I'm going to figure out what this nonprofit space is all about. And little by little, I started to, as I say, join boards of directors, get involved, uh, attend networking events relevant to the nonprofit sector. And, you know, these years later, we actually founded an organization, Harry, called the Nonprofit Resource Hub, uh, really just the Nonprofit Resource Hub, just an organization to focus for nonprofits where they can get what I like to call best of breed professional, best of breed specialists. So it's not a networking group. It's more of a trade association for nonprofits, if you will, where nonprofits can get access to resources, business professionals, advice, and different things that are relevant to their sector. So long story short, if there's such a thing, I'm, I tend to be more short story long in my approach. Um, but, you know, I actually had a friend of mine, we used to work together and he goes, he had heard me say, all right, hang on a second, long story short. He goes, hold on. He goes, you couldn't make a long story short if you wanted to. And I said, fair enough, Mike. <laughs> so anyhow, I tried, but the short, the short of it is I am the nonprofit sector connector. My responsibility is I believe it, even just this morning in some meetings is how do I make appropriate connections for both my professional relationships, my nonprofit relationships and my personal relationships. And Harry, it looks like this to me. It's like picture two lanes in a highway, right? Never these lanes will cross. Okay unless there's some reason, some obstacle in the road that makes them cross. So think of it in terms of two professionals on these parallel paths. And if the nonprofit sector connector is not that quote unquote obstacle that gets in the way or that catalyst that creates that relationship, well then these two people, businesses, entities, nonprofits never meet and never collaborate together. So I take that very personally as my own responsibility and obligation and have for many years Way before I was the nonprofit sector connector, mm -hmm. I was a connector, man, you know, like super connectors, you know, like these, you know, um, gosh, why can't I think of the book? Um, you know, I will look it up during the break, which we're probably not going to have a break, but okay. <laughs> when you start, if I ever let you start talking, it's like I'll, Bob Berg or someone like that. No, you know what it is? It's, uh, I think, is it Seth Godin? Oh. Um, we'll find it. Yeah. So someone famous. Someone famous and not, not me. Um, the, the thing about it is, it's about, I feel this passion for bringing people together, bringing the businesses and the nonprofits together, certainly. So for me, it's just a natural thing. And then when I re realized that nonprofit sector rhymed with connector, well, then it just kind of happened. So I, I, so passionately, man, I'm just trying to look, here's what I say all the time, Harry. I believe I got 50 years of life left. Correct. Trying to make an impact, trying to make the biggest impact I can in, in legacy and and really just have people go wow we're better off for having been in his sphere connected to him and now maybe our organization is better and we can serve more people maybe our employees are better taken care of from an employee benefits perspective you know like that's really all it is man that's all i'm trying to do really good all right so there's a couple of questions in there i'm afraid to ask any because i might end the show on that question but okay all right so <laughs> the nonprofits, what is, what would you say is a, a very uh, common challenge that they face other than fundraising um, that you can suggest to people is like, if you want to get involved in a nonprofit, this is where they need help. What wow. would that be? Or is there a thought yeah. like that? Uh, I, you know, so I'm in the process of creating something myself that you, I don't even know if you and I have talked about yet. But it's so I do a, a weekly show. It's called Philanthropy and Focus, where I interview executive directors and nonprofits. I say to help them tell their story and amplify their message. And you know, in in doing that, in doing 135 some odd episodes of Philanthropy and Focus so far, because I do it every Friday morning, I, I've had the opportunity to connect with a lot of leaders and nonprofits. And I believe that, and this is not only for nonprofit organizations. I believe it because again, back to the connector thing. I really believe that people. And leaders don't always have the right mechanics to best maintain relationships and nurture relationships. What do I mean? Business relationships, making those deposits, as Stephen Covey would talk about mm -hmm. in Seven Habits, making those deposits into relationships. And uh, I, I really see as an opportunity, if you since you ask it that way, where people could get involved with or 
support and structure nonprofit organizations aside or, or hold up nonprofit organizations aside from just the fundraising that you talk about is the strategy around developing relationships, the strategy around creating and nurturing relationships. Could be, there's a lot of stakeholders we're talking about. We talk about relationships from the perspective of, of donors, of major donors. We talk about it in terms of board members, right? We talk about it as far as collaborators. I think of, you know, I'm doing an event and, you know, I bring together two nonprofit organizations and where, you know, they both do similar work and serve a similar population, but it's complementary. It's not competitive, right? So it's where those things lie and where, the, where are those opportunities? And, you know, look, maybe some of that comes instinctual, Harry. Maybe it's because, you know, sales guys, right? We're sales mm -hmm. guys, air quotes, everybody. If you're only listening, I'm doing air quotes. But, you know, we're consultants. We're business professionals that bring resources, assets, education to our clients aside from just, you know, here's what I sell. I sell health insurance. Well, that's nice and that's helpful and it helps me attract and retain talent, but there's more to that, to the relationship. So I think that's a big part of it is when somebody engages with a nonprofit, you know, to look at the value of the relationship. And from the nonprofit perspective, what I'd say is to think in terms of if somebody joins the board of my organization or somebody is a donor of my organization, let's think in terms of a partnership. Let's think in terms of like, how can I, as the nonprofit, help that partner? Which may sound like I'm trying to turn something on its ear, but the point of the matter is, I think historically, in my experience, some nonprofit organizations will ask somebody to sponsor the golf outing or sponsor the gala, um, write a check, maybe you get a table, maybe you bring some of your friends. However, it's almost um, one-sided. Whereas I think the nonprofits that really get it and really make that strategic relationship are the ones who say, Harry, you're a businessman. How can I serve you? How can, right? Game changing. Right. Yeah. I feel oh. that, but it's a game changer yeah. because now I've, I've, they've come to the, to their business partner, right? They're, they're one of their vendors or their supporters or the board chair and said, what do you need? Now that's, that's different. And I think that difference is what makes something more productive and longer term. So yeah. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I love it. So I was laughing uh, primarily because I've been thinking the same. Like an example is, is, it's just like sales. So you have someone that's a donor is like a client. The client buys from you by donating to the nonprofit. Right. And the only time that they hear from many of the nonprofits, not all, is when it's fundraising time. So here is, it's like in sales, is that if your client is only hearing from you when there's a new product or something else to sell, that starts to get old. And then people don't necessarily feel as valued. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it's an opportunity for people who are in the nonprofit space to reflect and say, Look, so and so has been donating for years. What do I really know about their business? Is there a way? Maybe I can't help them financially, but I've got all of these businesses that are supporting us. Is there a connection there where we can help each other? Is that what you're already doing? But that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think you hit the nail on the head, as they say. I mean, for me, uh, I don't know that everybody's going to subscribe to or buy into what you and I just said. Uh, as you know, as nonprofit leaders or not, and, and that being said, many of them might be doing everything we said already correctly. Um, I just find, I mean, I've donated to organizations or done some volunteer work for organizations, you know, in six or twelve months goes by, and I haven't heard any. You know, oh, I heard a dog bark. Yes, uh, who's that? <laughs> they like to join the show periodically. I, I love when that would be Clover and Elvis. A couple of Clover and Elvis. Lives. Yes. Hey, the king has left the building. Uh, look, <laughs> you know. I, I tell you, I got to get my dog Cheeto on the show. I didn't know we were bringing show and tell and brave dogs. Cheeto's downstairs by the kitchen where I usually, oh, man. Um, but you know, if, for me, it's like, if we all see the world as from a perspective of through the lens of collaboration, Harry, and as leaders of businesses and nonprofits, we look for this partnership piece. I think of an organization, I think of, um, I use my friend, Ken Serini. I said his name earlier and I'll bring it up today again. 
because my friend Amy Zaslansky, who founded Book Fairies, which is a nonprofit organization that has given 4 million books, it's a tiny organization, right? Or it was. My friend Amy founded this organization because she was running a book drive for a local school district on Long Island. They've given away 4 million books, right? Doing an incredible job. Shout out to Eileen Minogue, who's the executive director over there now. But Amy is the founding ED. Uh, went to Ken Serini and said, look, I want to connect with you. I want to find a way where your 75 employee accounting firm can partner up with book fairies, right? Not write us a donation check, not give us a thing for the golf founding, a tea sponsorship or whatever. No, partner up. Now, as a result, as this relationship has blossomed, the organization receives, uh, the, every, for every billable hour that Serenian and Associates does, that money, or for every billable hour, they put a book in the hands of a child nice. in need. So there's something there. That's from the, from the top down, from Ken Serini as a guy who is a leader in the nonprofit sector, down to his associates in his firm, they realize, and on their signature, it says, you know, their email signature, we're partnered with book fairies. Here's what they've done here. What is that? That's culture that develops an organization of business to say, look, we're involved in our community. How do you and I know this? You know, when we talk about attracting and retaining talent, like I talk about from a benefits perspective and certainly with our clients, many people are saying, awesome, great. Thanks for the payroll, the, the, the money you're going to give me, the benefits you're going to give me, but what are you doing in the community? How are you giving back? How are you involved? So in a competitive environment right now, from an employment perspective, a firm like Serene and Associates is able to say, here's what we do. For every billable hour, a child gets a book. Like that is real stuff. And that creates culture. That creates the connection to the, the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector. So I, I, you know, I know you said you can wind me up and go. I sort of like, you know, just, just dress up the monkey and he's going to dance and sing a song. Like that's sort of what I do, which is, oh, you, you kind of wound me up. But the point of the matter is I get passionate. I go on about this stuff because it's real. It's game changing, Harry. It's awesome. All right. So, uh, as I'm thinking through this, I'm just thinking of the, the negative side because that's where some people go. Not that I am, but right. maybe the skeptic says, well, what's the financial return on that? Ooh. Because everything for some has to have a financial return. I'm not necessarily a believer in that mm. because I believe you put things out in the universe, stuff happens and good right. things come back to you and you don't, you can't look at everything as a financial return. So what's your thought on just the whole idea? Is there one or is yeah. that a question yeah. too cloudy? No, no, I think it's a good, I think it's a good question. And I can't say to you, like I've done the research and the statistics and here is you know, how many employees will stay around with your firm versus going across the street because of this, that, and the other thing. But I know there, I know it's out there and we can find those statistics at another show. When you bring me back, talk about it there. But for now, what I'd say is, first of all, you can't say no one can challenge us. Anybody can challenge us any way they want. But I don't think anybody has a, a serious argument to say that being involved in your community and giving back as a business professional is is in it has no value i mean that's silly to me that being said i understand where you're going i think i do some executive leaders in organizations are gonna go well, that's nice that we're giving back books or that's nice that we worked at the soup kitchen or that's nice that we had the the food drive and we're hooking up the pantry and helping them out what's it do for my bottom line well i know i, I know and understand this it costs a lot of money to hire people it costs a lot of money to onboard people right? There's a lot of training that goes involved. I mean, I grew up in the payroll business many, many years ago. I was a salesman for ADP when I first started my career. I, it, it, it pains me to say it was 20 years ago, 2003, that I started my career at ADP. It doesn't pain me to say, it's just weird to say, Harry, to say like I started my career in sales 20 years ago because I don't feel like I'm 45 years old. Don't tell anybody yeah. I just told you I'm 45. But I think, um, in terms of when we talked about, you know, attracting and retaining talent, even growing up in the payroll business, it was, I remember they would talk about onboarding and how expensive it was to lose somebody, right? That's bottom line. You know, there are facts. You and I could pause and Google this and find out answers if we wanted to, because there is ways if you maintain a relationship with an employee for seven years versus three years, well, that's a financial situation. So leaders right. of organizations, I think, I think realize and know that. Um, I remember, you know, I hang out with a lot of HR people, human resource professionals. And I remember years ago, 
you know, and I'm sure this isn't completely resolved yet, but I remember years ago, HR wanted a quote unquote seat at the table. You know, HR wanted a seat at the executive table, not always was, you know, you and I are familiar with the chief culture officer and the, you know, the chief, chief people officer and vice president of people and all these kind of things, which, you know, I think only 15 years ago or maybe less than that, were not even a thing, right? Hey, yes. Yeah, so I think not only HR needs and deserves a seat at the table, but recruiting deserves a seat at the table. Onboarding, we're seeing. And a lot of that, I, I didn't think we'd go into a whole HR discussion, but I think it's relevant to what happens to the culture of an organization by mm. partnering up and being involved in their community. A couple of weeks ago. I I noticed, sure. This is great. Yeah, a couple good weeks stuff. Ago, yeah, I got a phone call or text. I think it was a text from a buddy of mine who works over at uh, TD Bank, my buddy Scott Harwoods. Scott was like, hey, listen, we're doing another volunteer day, a day of service, which is a thing I'm big time into, days of service, 60 days of service, the whole thing. And I went out with a team from TD Bank and we went out on the... Uh, on the bay down at Freeport, Long Island. And we got, took this boat and the boat took us over and we cleaned up the beach. Garbage and plastics and uh, ceiling tiles and all this crap because houses had, you know, going back to Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm mm -hmm. Sandy, these homes had been knocked down and nobody picked the stuff up. Wow. It's going in on water, it's going, anyway, you can go out there every day and, and pick up more and more stuff. But that was a thing where TD Bank is very involved and they want to be very connected to you know, culturally involved in, in the communities. And they, you know, I think it's those major players that have a big part in this and a responsibility. Uh, but it's also the 20 or the 15 or the five employee company on main street that should and can have the opportunity to get involved with their community. So I feel myself spiraling and going in a lot of directions. So why don't you help me navigate to where, where else I could take us? Yeah. I mean, this, all right, so this is all great. I love culture. And, you know, when you think of a small business and they're trying to grow, culture may not be a priority. Right. So they're just thinking about sales, I need revenue, and so forth. Obviously, you mentioned a couple of things about culture. And I'm just curious as to if what was, how have you always been a culture guy or did this? work with the nonprofits help you to kind of see the light where culture can really make an impact because it brings about enthusiasm and excitement for the company, as well as generating revenue, being involved in the community. There's a lot of good that comes from culture. So what's the thought process as to how you got there and yeah, if there's benefits that I maybe we're I missing? Yeah, I think I, it's, it was outliers. It was Gladwell outliers. I had to look up where it's the connectors thing was. That's where we got to we'll go back to the Gladwell thing maybe today or next time you come bring me back on the show. How bold of me to say okay. next time next time <laughs> back on this show, Harry. How bold. Yes. Bold, Tommy D, how dare you? Look, I think <laughs> culture to me, I think is like, at the end of the day, what are we talking about with people, right? We inhabit this planet with other, other species, but for the most, most part, most of us interact with people more so than animals. Although I do another show, it's called the Professionals and Animal Lovers Show. Check it out, pal-show.com. Pal Some cool stuff happening there with the animals. But I think for the most part, we, most of us, I say, connect with people. So culture to me is how are the people connecting inside of an organization? How do you connect outside of an organization? What is the look and feel? What is the DNA of that organization? Can I say that this was always some, something that was important to me? No, probably as 24, 25 years old, when I was selling payroll for ADP, my intention was, uh, the culture is, how soon can we sell enough that we can get to the bar? Like, that was like the culture that was important, right? You know, as I, I think as all of us, as we mature in life, it becomes like, what does this company mean? What is the DNA? What is the value? What is the impact that this organization that I represent, that I spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week away from my family to do? Well, why, why am I aligned with that? So to me, it's the look and feel. It's what, do I get juiced up about this or do I get drained by this work? You know, does the company make a real impact in the world? Even if what it sells or does or creates might not be super impactful for the world and the environment, what do we do around that? You know, sometimes we, sometimes companies just make the things that are necessary, right? Can you extrapolate how valuable that is to the world? Sure you can, you know, tourniquets are very important, right? You know, crutches are important. Companies make these things. You know, what the microchips that go in my phone, those are important, right? Okay, we can say how it changes the world or we can just say, well, those are things that are necessary, but how does the company change? Because two companies that make or manufacture or sell the same thing 
are completely different based on how they care for their people internally, how they get involved, as we talked about, with nonprofit. So if, I think your question was, was I always a guy who looked at culture as such an important thing? Oh, probably not, because I was like, how much money am I going to make in this situation, right? Whereas younger sales guys, you and I were those one time, you know, <laughs> as younger sales guys, that's sort of what what's important at the time. I think, though, now, more so than ever, our clients, our prospective clients, our prospective partners are all looking for, well, what else are you doing, right? I mean, I'm sure you're here and, and we talk to other people. Yeah. Welcome back. Sure. Welcome back. Harry Spate makes an appearance. Yeah. So uh, that's what that black little microphone does. If, if I put a line through it, it stops me from talking. Look at you. You're figuring this thing out. I love it. Yes. Uh, new technology, folks. We have uh, incredible uh, new software to host a podcast. But yeah. So culture is something that we go back to is where you have longevity. People stay with a company. There, you can get into the why of people more. And even, if, you know, everyone could be creating a widget that you may not necessarily like our beautiful on-air signs. I mean, those aren't changing the world, but oh. someone in that place may be thinking the culture is so awesome that they just want to be around those people and the company's giving back to the community. So yeah. it doesn't need to be the product or what's exciting about the company. It could be what's inside the walls, so to speak. I, yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, to me, that's the whole point. Like, it's some of these things are necessities. Like, someone manufactures garbage pails, right? Those are important. I have like two blue ones and two green ones on the side of my house, and those are important, right? But maybe it's not changing the world. But what are the garbage garbage pail manufacturing company? You know, so I had no intention of talking about garbage pails. Harry, this is bring out the best in me, Harry. <laughs> I had no intention of it. And now I'm talking about garbage bales. But what if that company who, who you know, manufactures garbage bales is also brings their 75 employees out to the local food pantry or at the very least has a, has a relationship with the food pantry, right? Something or, we, or whatever the, the cause that's... And you know what I think is even more important? Here's what we can say. What about... Not assuming your employees want to work at the food pantry, but polling your second oh, even employees and finding out what's important to them. There was a book a bunch of years ago, and I picked yeah. up uh, I picked up two copies in case I wanted to read it more than once. And it was called it was called the Dream Manager, and the okay. Dream Manager was a fable. Um, I'm googling it so we can tell you who who wrote it. Everybody, okay, can check it out. But the Dream Manager was a story. Matthew Kelly was, it. and it was actually when I was at ADP. They were giving the book away to uh, prospective clients in the major account division. So I didn't buy the book twice. I think I took two copies from the mm -hmm. office, but I did. One of the, one of, the one that I read, <laughs> what it told you was some employees, the dream manager was like on the HR team, right? Okay. The dream manager was like a, a rolling cycle. Like Harry Spade would have been a dream manager for six months, and then Tommy D would be the dream manager for six months because it was a really cool gig and people wanted to do it. All yeah. right. So... What would happen is you would interview and survey your people. And some per some people might have really wanted a new car. They never had a new car. So you would sit with that employee and figure out, well, what can we do to help you get a new car, right? Some of the employees in this it, fictional company had to take like three buses to get to the, to the job site. So some of them wanted to have, they said, can we have a shuttle service where you can pick us game changing stuff, like mm -hmm. not like not heavy lift necessarily right. for the company, game changing for the employees, right? Other person was like, I want to go back to school. So, you know, some of the basic things that people sure. want to hear. I want to yeah. own a home. And that is a cool story. I'm going to go back and read the dream manager. In fact, Harry, I think I fib. I'm going to go back and listen to the dream manager on, on YouTube and let just somebody. I'm going to go buy the book. You can buy it and, and maybe you could read it for me. Yeah. My friend, Renee Daniel Flagler, who was the uh, executive director of Girls Inc. of Long Island, she's a friend, she's a client, we, we, we're just buddies, and she wrote, has written a couple of books. She writes under the pseudonym Nikki Knight, she writes romance novels, and then she writes other nonfiction work, you know, Dream Journey and different things like this. So somewhere in the attic here with me, I have her book, Dream Journey, and I said, I had said to her, I texted her one day, I was like, um... I got your book. I'm excited to read it. And at the same time, I want to listen to it. And I can't find it on Audible. And she's like, Tom Z, it's not on Audible. So I said, can I call you later? And can you just read me the book? She didn't read me the book. 
<laughs> no, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just trying to make you laugh, Harry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing a great job, and I'm trying not to spit in my microphone because I spent a lot of money on this microphone. Oh, oh my God. Uh, you got to have one of these things. You got these things? I got this little spit protector, <laughs> yes. but I got it, too. I didn't know what it was there for. I thought it was a hat. All right, so this has been a blast. You, you have brought the energy. Yeah, I mean, we could go on for hours, but no one's going to listen. After 25 minutes, all the data shows people just drop off. Is that what they say? Yeah, that's, that's what Oh, my get. God. I do I do two shows. They're an hour long each. That means yeah, no one's uh, listening. No. And the best part, we already went over. Good all right, stuff. so uh, this is great. We're going to have we're gonna have all kinds of clips. Okay. So it's going to be for, uh, around forever, evergreen, <laughs> YouTube, everywhere. It's going to be all over the place. So. Oh, my God. Well, that's good. But so if people it. want more of your incredible, quiet, soft energy, you know, there's just a low beaming energy, very subtle, hardly even noticeable. Where might they find you, Tommy? I mean, I appreciate you asking that. I mean, if you want to check out what I'm doing on Philanthropy and Focus, you can go to philanthropyandfocus.com and focus is spelled P-H-O-C-U-S because I grew up in a time when we used to say fat back in the 90s, P-H-A-T, plus I like alliteration. So philanthropy and focus, you can check me out there. Check me out on Instagram, tommyd.nyc, really trying to build up a presence there. Uh, for a professional side of things, Vanguard Benefits, Y-O-U.com, Vanguard Benefits, you, Y-O-U.com. Uh, and, and really check out the other thing we're doing, Pal Show professionals and animal lovers show and really i love linkedin i love instagram tommy demisa d-i-m-i-s-a reach out i'd give you my cell phone number but i'm afraid too many people would call so so use the social media let's connect that way and if i can help anybody just with you know connections relationships just kind of having a good chat uh i'm happy to do it harry you're a great friend for letting me come on here and just go i appreciate yeah, it i'm just trying to help you to get out of your shell yeah thank you're you. a very quiet really guy that guy. needs to come out of that <laughs> It's yeah. a big day. I feel good. I'm out of my shell. Uh, like, you know what it's like being Tommy D? Let me tell you something. By Friday night, I'm very tired. You know, yeah. very tired. <laughs> yeah, so you and I have had conversations early in the morning. You're not quite so wired when you're having your drink of red red juice, whatever I that stuff it. was. Oh, I drink that stuff. It's called Axio. Yeah, it's not just red juice. I don't know what they, you know, <laughs> A-X-I-O. <-X> <laughs> oh, no, it's some this, you know. Hocus pocus stuff I put in my drink. It's it's good. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but you know what, Harry? You, it's all time of day. And if you get me too early, I'm just getting going. We're just yeah. getting yeah. warm well, up. Now, now I know what the real year is like, I think. <laughs> Morning version, perhaps. All right, this has been a blast. Tommy D, thank you for making your appearance. We'll have to get you on again. I'll be back. Even though you only asked me 17 times in a podcast, <laughs> I assure you, we'll get on sometime in 24. I Great love stuff, man. Thank you, Harry. Thank you for listening to Sales Made Easy. If you found value in our conversations, please subscribe and leave a review. Our goal is to provide practical strategies for growing your business while staying true to your values. Remember, success in sales is about serving your clients. Serve first and the selling will follow. We'll be back soon with more insights and inspiration. Until then, keep serving and providing value to others. Good things will happen.